Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. Thank you for joining me today. My guest is the indomitable Peter Ash, who is the president and CEO of TwinCraft Skincare in Winooski, Vermont. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hi, Melinda. I'm very well. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I've been wanting to talk to you a lot about your life and your career. And so here we are today um, on this relatively gray March day. Um, but let's get let's get let's kick this right off. Now, Pete, you were born in Montreal, right? Tell us a little bit about your childhood. I was born in Montreal and uh, had a lovely childhood, wonderful parents, and um, lived there. Uh, went to school there, uh, and then ended up in Ontario, going to college, uh, and uh, left basically when I was around eighteen and. Um, really had a great, great childhood. I was very fortunate. Um, and eventually you, you came to the United States. What brought you here? Um, I, it's kind of a funny story, actually. I was, uh, I had traveled quite a lot. My mom used to be an Olympic skier. And so we traveled around. Um, we were a big ski family, kind of a big sports family. And uh, I realized when I was around 18 um, that I'd never seen uh, my country or much of my country. So I went out west and um, started working for a company uh, and uh, did that. It was actually Electrolux, of all things, knocking on doors. I went out there to get this big job in the oil industry or something. You know, I was young. I was 18. I just wanted to make some money. Figured I could make, I remember, like $18 an hour, which was a fortune. Didn't find anything. And so answered this blind ad, ended up knocking on doors, selling vacuum cleaners. And it, it turned out to be one of the best jobs of my life. Uh, taught me a lot about myself. And I had a wonderful manager, this guy named Edgar Litz, who'd been there for 30-odd years. And so I worked there right through college and started working for their corporate office in Toronto. And then after I graduated, they asked me to come down and work for their corporate office in Stamford, Connecticut. And that's what brought me into the States. And you ended up actually in New York, right? Ended up in New York. Um, what happened? Started working. Well, I started working for uh, my family business. I was actually going to go and run Electrolux's management training center in Atlanta. I was all of 25 years old at the time, and they wanted me to go down to Atlanta. I was uh, uh, kind of on my way there. My dad called and said he'd love me to come and work in the family business. And so we sort of uh, had a little negotiation and I ended up working uh, for the family business and we had an office in Livingston, New Jersey, uh, which is a lovely place if you have, if you're married and have kids and it's really kind of not the most lovely place if you're single and 25 years old. <laughs> so I thought, boy, I'd really like to get into New York and found an office in New York and from a spice company that had gone bankrupt. And um, uh, we were right uh, beside the Flatiron building on 23rd and 5th. And it was quite a lovely experience. I spent about uh, five years in New York during some pretty formative, uh, formative time in my life. So it was, it was, it was lovely and interesting. It's, it's, so, it's so fascinating to say. So what did you do? What was your like, first job? Out of college, oh, I I sold vacuum cleaners. I mean, it's, <laughs> but it was, you said it was I'll your best you. job ever. Which there you have it. It teaches you a lot about yourself because you have to get up in the morning. Uh, there, it's a commission job, and you're knocking on doors, and you have nobody. You don't know who's behind the door. Mm -hmm. And so, what I learned actually is people are pretty nice. They're kind. They're generous. And uh, I, was a, I was part of a college program and they really wanted to help. And I, I developed a very positive attitude about people. Um, and one of the main uh, parts of that was from this job. Funny enough, you know, cause- uh, No kidding, that's, Electra that's, Lux that's, that's the way it great, was. And they're great vacuum cleaners. So, you know, who, who, so who would you say Pete had the greatest influence on you growing on into the man you are today? Oh gosh. Um, 
That's a tough question to answer. I, I know, you know, I so, know, but I, but it's really important. It's really important. I, I think a lot of people have been, you know, real influences. Uh, you know, my dad, certainly my mom. Um, I've always been very close to both of them. And uh, my dad died last year, but my mom is still uh, up in Montreal. And, um, you know, they've always been uh, definitely, uh, you know, significant influences in my life, uh, you know, amongst amongst others as well. So. And maybe your first boss at Electrolux had some influence on you, too. He definitely did, you know, because, you know, I mean, vacuum cleaners has a you know, is is sort of a jaded industry selling door to door. You think of it like, oh, God, you know, and um, it was very it was, you know, you realize how deep things are when you actually are in them, you know, and when I say deep, I mean, meaningful and and positive. And, and he was a great guy. And then I went to, I started working in Ontario to this guy, Angus McClellan who came from Newfoundland. He was from a uh, family of 24, for real. Um, and he had a big influence on me. It was actually that particular branch was mostly filled with um, uh, reformed alcoholics because Angus was one, and that's who he hired to give them second chances. And uh, so I used to go to a meetings with the guys just out of curiosity, because, you know, it's, it's not something that uh, I'm not an alcoholic or anything, but uh, they said, yeah, come, you know, I've always been curious. And so that also had a real impact on me. Um, and uh, probably from there, I became an assistant parole officer because I was mixing it up with people who were, you know, uh, in need of some uh, you know, kind of the other side of the tracks, if you will. And uh, that was that was very helpful to me to to learn that because I came from a pretty privileged background. So you learned um, your, you, you learned your humanity from quite a few people. So, yeah. So, Pete, tell us a little bit about the history of Twincraft, which was started by your dad and his twin brother, Twincraft, and now by you and your brother. So tell us a little bit about the company. Well, we started in Montreal back in 72. We had our 50th anniversary uh, last year. And we expanded into the States. And uh, we were involved in a whole variety of businesses, really. Um, but mostly making soap was our principal uh, business. And uh, in 1986, I joined, uh, 80, pardon me, October 1, 84. Um, you know, it's amazing how many things you have stored up here that are kind of, of useless information, but uh, that uh, that's that. And um, we were doing a bunch of different things, and eventually we ended up just focusing on contract manufacturing, manufacturing product for uh, brands, high-end brands, medium to high-end brands, and um, and we shut our down our Montreal facility. Our Vermont facility became kind of our principal facility, and um, we grew pretty substantially from there because uh, it was uh, it's a good business to be in. It's sort of like behind the scenes. The brands all do their thing, but we're we're making for many of the brands uh, different types of product. So, so what inspired your family to move the company to Vermont? Well, it was interesting. It was uh, in the uh, 70s. There were a lot of political uh, issues in Quebec. And, um, you know, you had the language police, you know, who were kind of on top of my dad and my uncle because uh, their their business was twin craft. And they said, well, that's not right because twin is an English word and it has to be jumel craft because jumel is the French word for twin and everything has to be in French. And that was just sort of a real nuisance. And... Uh, in addition to that, we're doing a lot of business in the States, about 50% of our business. So they had to expand the Montreal facility. And they said, you know, given everything that's going on in Montreal, why don't we just expand to the States and build another facility there, hop over the border, because we had 20% duties from Canada to the U.S. So we could avoid those duties and, and be competitive. You know, it was sort of a trade barrier uh, for manufacturers uh, in the States to keep 
other manufacturers out. So we just hopped over the border, did that, and it worked out really, really well. Uh, so well that we decided to close up the Montreal facility and just be here. Your parents stayed, your parents continued to live in Montreal. They did. Yep. Yeah. But by then I had joined the company. I was president. And uh, so my dad was sort of, you know, half retired by then and then fully retired by, uh, you know, the mid nineties. And um, so that, so it worked out well for everybody, actually. And I love Vermont. I actually ended up moving up from New York to Vermont. Well, we're so glad you did. Um, <laughs> so I know there was a period of time a few years ago when you and your brother sold the company. And then you turned around and you bought it back. Tell us a little bit about that story. So when we decided to go and become contract manufacturers, um, it was a bit of a revolutionary thing for the business because we were involved in three businesses and we decided to focus on one. And, um, and it was a troubled time for the company. It was 1994, actually. Um, so that was, turned out to be a really good decision. Um, the company became a lot smaller, but from there we expanded very quickly and to the point where we became very quite successful uh, financially and uh, we were much bigger. And uh, there was a desire uh, amongst, um, I had uh, my brother and two other minority partners uh, to sell the business. Uh, it was 2006, uh, as you recall, uh, this country was pretty um, excited about a lot of things. I say coked up and, you know, it was a big party. Um, and uh, so we had a lot of offers and we decided to sell the business, but I stayed on with the business. The others left and uh, eventually uh, some right away, some uh, after a year or two. And I stayed on on contract. Uh, sold to this public company, and the idea was to kind of use their money to get into the skincare business because uh, we wanted to build a factory, get into skincare, and didn't want to take all the risk. And I was happy staying in the business, so I stayed in the business and um, kind of on contract, if you will, a three-year contract. Uh, it worked out really well. A lot of people said there's no way you'll ever be able to work for anybody else, but actually it it was quite fine. It was it was good. You know, the financial pressures were off, if you will. And um, uh, and I worked for them and they were a public company. So I was going to New York for all the meetings, the 10 Ks, Qs, all, all of that kind of stuff, uh, which was interesting. Um, and then uh, the big recession happened, as you recall, in 08, 09, the credit freeze and everything. We sort of fortunately sold at just the right time. Uh, it was the best year we'd had for and, and, and have had, you know, at least until a few years afterwards. And um, so they decided, let's sell the business. And I ended up buying it back. Um, and then my brother came back into the company after, um, uh, during that period. And that was January, 2012. And we've sort of expanded pretty dramatically since then and gotten and built the skincare business out of the success of the sale. And, uh, we're able to fund it ourselves and, uh, you know, kind of keep the shares close as well so that we remain a Vermont company and Vermont controlled. We didn't we didn't have to bring in private equity to grow or do any of that. So that's been very pleasing, I think, and very satisfying. That's wonderful. Good for you for bringing it back into the family. So now your company um, creates skincare products from oils, soaps, suntan lotions, creams, you name it. Is there anything that you would like to make that you haven't yet? Um, we, we, we like to hope and think that that which we make, um, we should become expert at. And then as we become expert at it, you know, capitalism is pretty competitive. So, you know, we, if you're jack of all trades, you truly are master of none. So you need to get be excellent at what you do. And as we become excellent at one item, let's say, let's say that's um, uh, emulsions, doing uh, lotions, things like that, then we will go to other items. So we're doing SPFs now, we're doing deodorants, um, underarm deodorants, et cetera, all natural kind of stuff. We, we tend to, our bias is towards natural. So we do natural deodorants, natural SPFs, et cetera. 
um, they're zinc based and whatnot. And and um, there's there's a growing market, uh, a big, a good size market for that, and it's growing as well. But but we stay focused on doing, becoming expert at things, and then expanding to another category. The skincare business is a large business. You know, we could be a significantly larger company and probably will be over time. Is so we're careful, careful, careful not to do too much. So has anybody come to you where you said, you know, we're not, we're really not interested? In selling or? In making and creating. Has somebody come to you? With oh, yeah. Where you kind of go, no, that's not our, that's not our gig. Yeah, we went through our little uh, walk through the desert at the beginning where we had a lot of people asking for like mineral based SPFs that, you know, SPF 70. And we said, well, we'll think about it. That's the wrong answer. The answer is no, we don't do it. But here's what we do and focus on that because as soon as you sort of give a customer an idea you might be able to do it then your lab starts working on it and we have a pretty big lab so we try to stay focused on that which we can become excellent at and and leave it at that and and learn to say no to that which we can't do and it's not in our expertise right and that's worked well so you get 70 percent of your energy to run your operation from the sun that's pretty impressive how do you figure that? Oh, oh, you mean in, uh, yeah, of course. 70% of the energy that you yes. use to do what you do is renewable energy. I mean, you're you're kind of a leader in this. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's important to us. Absolutely. So good for you on that. Uh, now, TwinCraft made their first bar of soap back in 1972, which is the year that my son was born. He's now 50. <laughs> And now you are a $40 million a year company with over 250 employees. What do you attribute to your incredible success, Peter? Yeah, um, we actually did 80 last year, 80 million. Um, wow. So we've grown. Oh gosh, we've well, grown. Your website is a little old. I, let me change that. <laughs> 80 million. You've doubled, it. You've doubled it from the, the time that I found that. So, so you are an $80 million a year in gross sale company. That's amazing. So what, what do you attribute to your success? Uh, getting into the skincare business, the soap business, the great, the bar soap business, a great business, but skincare is substantially larger. So, you know, after 50 years of bar soap and only eight years of skincare, our skincare business is actually now um, bigger than our bar business and growing quickly. Is there so a, there, there's a lot of opportunity. Is there a specific skincare that uh, Peter Ash likes to use? <laughs> I have a special formula that they make for me in the lab. Yes, it's a shea butter formula just for me. <laughs> really? Well, I want some of that because you have beautiful skin. Oh, you're sweet. You <laughs> Thank <do>. you. <laughs> so, um, Peter, I love the video on your website. It's a view in the bathtub full of bubbles. So if I ever dreamt about seeing you taking a bubble bath, dream no more. I just needed to go to twincraft.com. Um, and I encourage all my viewers to go to twincraft.com and, and visit that website. It's phenomenal. But the, the, the videos of you um, in, in the bathtub. So tell us a little bit about that, because about that, they're hysterical. Well, we work with Jim Lance. And Jim is um, a Burlington guy. He's fantastic. He's wonderful to work with. And he's very creative. And he believes that in order to attract people into a company you really have to show them what the company's about and we like to have a lot of fun we like to be you know um humble or as humble as we can be and really kind of show our humanity and so the whole idea of that video was to really show who we are and keep it away from being corporate. There's and there's so many corporate videos and they don't resonate with people. So, you know, climbing into a bathtub half naked, getting filled with bubbles was uh, it was a fun experience. And uh, and it worked pretty well as far as, on, you know, showing people who we were and are. Well, it was great. And and there's three of them on your on your website, twincraft.com. And I encourage all of my viewers to visit the website. Now, Peter, you talk a lot about fun in the workplace. Um, can you tell us your philosophy around fun and some of the ways you inject fun into your workplace? Yeah, you know, we're on this planet a pretty short period of time. And uh, I hope there's something afterwards, but uh, I'm not going to kind of count on it. Uh, and so 
you know, it's it's important to have a good time at work, have a good time during your life, period. And so we try to promote that and, you know, try to have a really healthy, positive, happy work environment. And, you know, that manifests itself in many different ways, but it's really just about human interaction and, you know, enjoying each other and, and having people who really enjoy being together. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of water cooler, the old, you know, they say the water cooler talk and whatnot. It's, it's just, just being together is, is very enjoyable. And so uh, we really try to promote having people who are, you know, kind of humanists who like to be together. So, so have you had trouble finding employees because the, the website is so positive and upbeat? I mean, I'm like, oh, I think I want to apply for a job at TwinCraft. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, have you had trouble finding employees or has it been for you pretty, pretty easy? How's it going? I think, I, I think it's always a challenge finding really excellent people always. And, and it's a challenge in a big recession. It's a challenge in, you know, when, when there's a huge expansion and very few people around, it's just a continuous challenge. That said, we hired a lot of people in uh, May, 2020, as everybody was, in a full scale panic, we said, let's go forward because I'm a bit of a contrarian. If everybody's retreating, move forward. Yeah. And there's a lot of opportunity when kind of the herd is moving in one direction. And so um, my president and I, we, we really sat down and said, this is the time to hire a lot of people. The skincare business is really moving forward. We believe in it. If we overhire, well, you know, we'll figure it out. And and so it was uh, tremendously beneficial because we hired a lot of people and the business grew substantially. And then when suddenly nobody was available and other companies were struggling, we, we were in great shape. Good for you. Now, your wife, Michelle, is the vice president of leadership and organizational development. She's a powerhouse of a woman. I adore her. Tell us a little bit about working with your spouse. Uh, it's great. We work very well together. We're very fortunate to Simpatico. be able to work well together. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely. Very simpatico. Exactly. Um, we we just work very well together. We understand each other, and um, so it's it's really no problem at all. Uh, she's very helpful to the business. She's she's done some really tremendous things. And she's so upbeat and positive and fun. Now I understand that your son is now involved in the operation. So as a family-owned business, it seems as if it will remain that for at least a few more generations. Well, that's the um, hope and the plan. And um, my brother-in-law is in the business as well. He works over in the skin carrier. Uh, my brother, Rich, uh, has been back in the business fully for quite some time. So um, we're, we're kind of an interesting hybrid because we have a family business, but we're also very professional and, uh, and we like to keep it that way because it's, I think it's really important for everybody to keep it that way. Absolutely. So, um, many of your employees have worked at TwinCraft for many years. Um, and you do have a corporate consciousness that makes working at TwinCraft special. Tell us a little bit about that, about your social responsibility in your business. I think we decided a long time ago that uh, it's not all about money. Um, we have to have, um, we're running a business. So, you know, I, I like to say we're not all about the money on the one side, but we're also not kumbaya on the other side. You have to sort of, how do you get that balance? Because the balance is where it's, it's very rich. When I bought the company back, actually, uh, and Rich came back, the whole one of one of my biggest um, uh, objectives was to create a very resonant culture, a culture that, you know, treated people well, paid well, was fun, um, and uh, we were growing, uh, and also making a lot of money because you have to make a lot of money if you're gonna, you know, we we spent couple of million dollars just renovating the offices. We have three buildings now, a quarter of a million feet of space that we manufacture and warehouse in. Um, so, you know, to be 
a healthy business and and do well like we have a 401k where we match five and five so you know if you put five percent in you immediately double your money which in this day and age in the stock markets uh i guess in any day and age is pretty good but particularly now is fantastic so you know but that costs that costs us four or five hundred thousand dollars a year just that one thing alone the matching so you know you have to um kind of blend being a tough business, but also being a humane business. And how do you how do you do that? And that's it, it's a big part of what I believe in life is to achieve that balance. And I think uh, we're sort of, if the right word is didactic, where humans have a struggle to get into the middle. And it's something I'm always trying to achieve to get to that middle area where really there's balance. And I think that's where life is. Fascinating. So for my viewers who don't know about your company because it sort of is in the background of these important brands. Tell us about some of the brands that are created at TwinCraft that my viewers might recognize. Um, well, some of the brands are uh, Glossier, uh, Native. Uh, some of the legacy brands would be like Estee Lauder, et cetera. Um, we make for about 120 different brands right now. So there's many, many different brands that are very recognizable, actually. I mean, they're they're big brands. And um, like, for instance, Native, which is one of our customers, they were bought by Procter & Gamble. Uh, but really, we deal with Native rather than with the kind of big, uh, big company. Uh, we deal mostly with with the brand, if you will. Um, and the brands are always looking for innovation. They're always looking for innovation. So we have um, a lab. We've got uh, a dozen people in our lab and we're very innovative. We try to continuously create products and, and really give to the customers what they're looking for, which is innovative, interesting products that they can grow their brand and have an exciting brand. So when a company comes to you, it's not that you're, it's not, they're not necessarily coming with, to you with the formula. You're, you're in, you're being innovative in creating the formula for the brand. That's fascinating. So, um, so what, what do you do for fun? What's your fun thing that you do? What's your favorite fun thing to do, Peter Ash? Do I tell that on air, Melinda? Yes, of course you do. This is your moment with Melinda. Come on. Yes, you All do. All right. Uh, well, I went to the Bruce Springsteen concert in Boston Monday night, which was absolutely amazing. 73, I mean, what an, what an inspiration. A 73-year-old man who's three hours rocking on stage with an 18-member band and uh, full of songs that are all about life and love and meaning. And it was really, and it's rock and roll. It was really quite something. So I, I like to do things like that. I like to ski. Um, you know, we've got uh, five young adults, uh, so we spend uh, a fair bit of time with them. And, uh, you know, I'm very active sports-wise, too. I like to uh, hope that I'll stay healthy and well for as long as I can. Well, so, uh, I swim, I ski, I do, you know, a lot of different things, I guess, sports-wise. Good for you. Um, so, Peter, what do you see for the future of our world? What's your vision for what's coming up in the next 20, 25 years? You know, it, I'm asked this question a lot, and it's very interesting because, you know, we seem to be in this place these days that is a little bit dark and kind of biased to the negative, but I don't believe that actually for a minute. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the what is this, the expression, the arc, you know, tends towards, um, the arc of his you know, greater. Greater justice, is, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I'm, I'm reading a book right now called Factfulness. Uh, it's by Hans Rosling, Factfulness. And it really dispels all, so many of the myths that we seem to be uh, prone to believe and, uh, you know, explains that, you know, the world's actually doing pretty well despite everything. And I, I think you know, these things have kind of been a window toward to seeing everything. And sometimes everything can look pretty ugly and we we lose the bigger picture. I like I like to think that I I stay in context. It's part of what I 
my, my way of being, if you will, is to try to always stay in context, to see things from the, the to see the bigger picture, because you can get lost in the minutiae. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news and, you know, you're ready to, you know, take a razor blade to your neck, you know, after seeing the news a lot. I mean, it's, it's, but, but, but people seem to relish that. And yet at the same time, we all want to be positive and, and there's a lot of positive things, you know, I mean, people being lifted out of poverty and, um, you know, uh, you know, if you just look at a few, I mean, look at how we lived a few hundred years ago. Good Lord. I know. Truly, truly. So you have a very young staff. You have over 200 employees um, and you have young, you have six, I believe six children. Uh, what wisdom do you give these young folks? And that includes your six children to help them tackle the world that they are growing up in? Um, it's actually five children. And we um, had a Sudanese boy, a South Sudanese uh, young man now um, live with us, um, Luef, for many years. Uh, we're close with him. He's just, just a really beautiful soul. And um, uh, I think the wisdom is, you know, be positive. You only have one life. And so, you know, don't waste it. It's uh, you know, do do that which really gives you energy and, um, uh, you know, enjoy the time that you have in this world. It's precious, and uh, you know, you, you want you want to enjoy it. You want to make it meaningful. And I and I think from this interview, my viewers will see that you are someone who have created a socially responsible and caring company. And that's, and I'm sure your your children and your employees watching you and Michelle navigate through through your lives and through your business um, has been a, a source of, of 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 wisdom for them. I'm sure it has been. Wouldn't you say? I, I hope how so. You, I how hope you so. live your life? I mean, you are a mentor, yeah. and you and you are a, 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 in so many ways a spiritual guide for them. So that's great. Well, listen, we've come to the end of my show. I could talk to you for ever. Um, I wish you well. I love knowing you and being a part of your, your air. And thank you for all you do for our community um, and all that you've done for our community over the years. And give my love to Michelle. And you take care, Peter Ash. You're an amazing human being. Thanks for being on my show. Well, thank you, Melinda. You are an amazing person. The things you've done is, are really extraordinary. And uh, we, we love you and so appreciate what you do. So thank you. Thank you. And to my viewers, I'll see you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.